Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Our next part of magnetism involves a mass spectrometer, which is the most common application in terms of solving for magnetic force. The mass spectrometer is really consists of two parts, and the first part is a velocity selector. A velocity selector is basically an area that consists of an electric field and a magnetic field at the same time. Now, because there is an electric field and a magnetic field at the same time, if we were to take a look at this diagram over here, we know that electric field lines go out of positive and into negative. So if I had an electron floating going into it, it would feel a QE or an FE upwards. At the same time, you can see that there is a magnetic field, which is going into the page. Now, using my left-hand rule, because it is a negative charge, I can see that if the electron is going to the right and the fingertips are going into the page, my palm is going straight down. So they're going to, it's going to feel a QVB going down. So FB is equal to QVB. So this would be my free body diagram, especially assuming that gravity is negligible. Simply because the mass is so tiny, the force would be so weak. Now, knowing that QE and QV are trying to balance out, if we take a closer look at this picture over here, when the particles are going through, if they're going too fast, you know, then the QVB increases simply because of the velocity inside there, okay? If they're going too fast, they end up veering more because of the magnetic force. If they go too slow, then the FE ends up being stronger, and it ends up veering in the opposite direction. But if it goes at exactly the right speed, then the fact is that the QVB, the magnetic force, and the electric force are going to cancel each other out. And when they cancel each other out, the charge ends up going in a straight line and it passes through the hole. So the reason it's called a velocity selector is simply because only a very specific velocity will be able to make it through. If it's too fast, it's deflected one way. If it's too slow, it's deflected the other way. So in this case over here, okay, if we do know that QVB can equal to QE, we're going to set the two equal to each other. And there's a Q on each side which means it crosses out, which really means that the size of the charge has no bearing on whether the particle makes it through or not. The fact is the velocity is simply equal to the electric field divided by the strength of the magnetic field. Okay, so in this case over here, so the electron will only pass through when QE and QVB perfectly equal to each other. <clears throat> so when two parallel plates are separated by a distance of five centimeters and have a voltage of 250 volts, okay, let's take a look at our information. The potential difference is 250 volts. The distance between the plates is 0 0.05 meters. Now, they mentioned that the magnetic field is 15 Teslas. They ask, what speed does the electron have to have in order to pass through the parallel plates unhindered? Now, the, so the formula here is simply knowing that QE is equal to QVB. So therefore, V is equal to E divided by B. We have the magnetic field. Don't confuse this little volt velocity V with the voltage V. In fact, it's this voltage V allows us to solve for what the electric field is because my parallel plate formula was E equals to V, capital V, 
over D. So the electric field is actually equal to 5,000 volts per meter. So plugging this value in for velocity, I can solve that E is equal to 5,000 volts per meter divided by 15 Teslas. Now, don't worry about the units. They're going to work out. But ultimately, my answer would be the 333.33 meters per second. If scientists were to adjust the potential difference, adjust the plates, you know, it would change the value of the velocity. So therefore, scientists can fine tune exactly what speed they want as it passes through. Okay. Now, mass spectrometer is the second part. So over here, we still have the velocity selector. But a mass spectrometer deals ultimately with the entire part. And the second part is just an open magnetic field. There's no more electric field. And the purpose of the mass spectrometer is to determine the mass of charged particles. So in this case over here, it's going to use circular motion to solve for m. After the electron passes through, <clears throat> we know that there was a QE going up and a QVB going down, when the electron reaches the second portion, there's no more QE. There's only a QVB pointing down now in this case, which means that if I use my left-hand rule, knowing that the velocity is to the right, knowing that QVB is pointing down, knowing my magnetic field, of course, is going into the page, I know that the electron is going to travel basically in a circle, assuming that the electric field, the magnetic field has been extended. So over here, the electron curves down. I know that QVB will equal to mv squared over r. So if I want to solve for the mass of the particle, the v's will cross out, and I end up with mass is equal to Q B R over V. Okay. But a lot of times scientists don't know the charge or the mass of a particle. So when they shoot these different particles through, rather than solving for just the mass, sometimes they solve for the charge to mass ratio. In other words, they're looking for Q over M. So looking back at our original equation over here, if I want to solve for Q over M, I can bring the M over, and I, I would end up with now, in this case instead, V velocity over BR. Okay? So sometimes they solve for mass. Sometimes they solve for the charge to mass ratio, depending on what information is known about the particle. Over here, you can see that different sources with different masses would end up with different radii. And scientists can look at where the particle lands to determine what the mass exactly is. If we take a look over here, here's another representation. We're shooting a negative charge in. And you can see that using the hand rule, the f magnetic force was to the right. However, if you switch this to a positive charge, using your right hand, the magnetic force would be pointing now to the left. And you can see it curving in the opposite direction. It's only curving, of course, when it's within the magnetic field. We could change the strength of the magnetic field, and in the end, we'll see different values based on what's happening within the problem.